So when I'm making videos on these obscure music topics, I often come across an interesting fact. I think to myself, man, I need to share this at the dinner table. And I bet a lot of you guys do too. Well, this is gonna be a whole video of just that. Number one, 20% of these songs on Spotify never get played once. This fact came from Spotify themselves back in 2013 when they shared an infographic on the company's fifth birthday. One such detail was that 80% of songs on Spotify have been streamed at least once, meaning the remaining 20% hadn't been streamed at all. It conjures a rather dark image that one in five songs on Spotify are so forgettable, so insignificant, not even the creator's mother will give it a spin. This inspired a trio of programmers to create Forgotify, a web app that pulls together all these unplayed gems. Although, unfortunately, the app hasn't been updated in a long time. And the few songs I sampled did in fact have listeners. Johnson boys went a hunting, took two dogs. Some a lot. So I think the API might be broken. To my knowledge, Spotify has never updated this figure. After all, it is a bit embarrassing to admit. But it should be acknowledged that Spotify has grown a lot since 2013. Mind you, 2013 was a time when the iTunes store still was king. It's very possible that the increased market dominance of Spotify means that fewer tracks go unlistened. Spotify did reveal that in 2022, about two-thirds of the artists on the platform had fewer than 10 monthly listeners. While that's not the same as zero plays, it is a staggering number that shows just how unforgiving the internet void truly is. Number two, David Bowie inadvertently transformed reggae in the 1980s. In the mid 80s, reggae was undergoing a shift. Drum machines and synthesizers were replacing guitars and horns, paving the way for the dancehall stars of the 2000s. But in one of these stranger twists of music history, it's very possible that none of this would have happened without one little track from Ziggy Stardust. Let's back up for a second. In the early 80s, the dominant form of reggae music was called dancehall. Producers were starting to chop up samples of older songs to create more exciting beats. These beats were known as rhythms. And at a time when copyrights weren't strictly enforced, a single rhythm could be used on hundreds of different tracks. Rhythms were typically samples of older reggae songs. Until the mid-1980s, when these two men were fiddling with a newly purchased Casio keyboard. After inadvertently triggering the preloaded rock beat, the pair knew they found something special. There was when Wayne touched something and he jumped out. And I said, hear that, you know, and we, we both said, hear that. And then I realized I can't stop it and start it. I realized how it really worked. Then that's when I was take it to Jammies. They quickly brought the keyboard to King Jammies recording studio and together created the Slain Tane rhythm, which would take the reggae world by storm. It was the first digital reggae hit and it would inspire countless others to follow. From down in the country, this is all I want to know. If you pick me up, you lift me down, my bomb strike back. Give me know myself as a mic specialist. I never ever make my mic as a bomb strike Years later, when the significance of this built-in rock beat became undeniable, music fans tried to figure out who created it and what, if anything, it was based on. 
Many fans speculated Eddie Cochran something else. Or the Sex Pistols, Anarchy in the UK. I am an Antichrist. The creator of the beat was Japanese musicologist Okuda Hiroko, who was employed by Casio at the time. In 2015, she dispelled the rumors that it was Cochrane or the Sex Pistols, telling Engadget that it was inspired by a British rock record from the 70s. And, quote, you would immediately notice it once you hear the song. This shifted everyone's attention to David Bowie's Hang On To Yourself. And for many, all but confirmed Mr. Stardust's inadvertent contribution to digital reggae. However, in 2022, Hiroko appeared to walk this back. In an interview with Nippon.com, she said, I did used to listen to a lot of British rock, so I'm sure there must have been songs that influenced me. But really, the bass line was something I came up with myself. It wasn't based on any other tune. Was this indeed the truth? Or was Hiroko simply covering her tracks? I personally find it hard to unhear the David Bowie connection, considering her previous comments and just how closely the melodies match. Let's roll that one more time. So while it does remain unconfirmed, I will continue to thank David Bowie every time I'm woken up by reggaeton beats in the middle of the night. Thanks, Bowie. Number three. Obscure 90s hip hop from Memphis it's currently taking Russia by storm. Around the year 2020, a trend took over Russian and Eastern European Instagram. Videos of cars drifting were accompanied by lo-fi beats and a digital cowbell. And some of this music was actually pretty impressive. The genre was known as drift funk, a variant of funk not to be mistaken with F-U-N-K funk. You might say it's the ultimate Gen Z genre, made possible only in a hyper-online world, where the lines between sarcasm and sincerity have thoroughly dissolved. Funk has a long and complicated history that we won't get into right now. But what's important to know is that if you listen carefully, many of these songs have samples of rapping, barely audible in the background. These aren't just any rap lyrics. They are specifically from a small community of Memphis rappers from the late 80s and early 90s. So, in other words, a mid-sized American city that hasn't been a hub of pop music in years had inspired kids from thousands of miles away who weren't even born yet. Huh. What made Memphis rap so special is that it wasn't under the spotlight. While coastal rappers were cutting tracks with the hopes of making it on the radio, Memphis rappers were self-releasing tapes for the enjoyment of their peers. They used cheap four-track recorders and didn't hold back from sounding as eerie, otherworldly, or violent as possible. Just take this early track from 3-6 Mafia. If you ask me, it shares more in common with Steve Reich than anything mainstream hip-hop at the time. Over the years, the demonic and otherworldly elements of Memphis hip-hop have inspired a body of internet lore. It's been detailed on podcasts and YouTube videos. And this is likely what's made funk so appealing to basement dwellers in Russia, Ukraine, Brazil, and many other corners of the world. Number four. Steve Wozniak of Apple hosted one of the strangest music festivals, and also may have contributed to the breakup of The Clash. As the old saying goes, 
Music festivals are such a risky investment. You almost need a traumatic brain injury to attempt one. Well, that's exactly what happened to Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak. In 1981, he suffered a serious injury after crashing his single-engine plane and needed to step away from Apple. With gobs of cash and plenty of time on his hands, Woz decided to put together a massive music festival for no other reason than to see all his favorite bands in one place. There is never a concert where there's a ton of music that I want to see with a list of groups, you know, 30 top groups around the world. The Us Festival was actually hosted twice, in 1982 and 1983, extending over three-day weekends in San Bernardino, California. It was incredibly innovative for its time, part technology expo, part yuppie Woodstock. In its second iteration, there was a first-of-its-kind satellite link with the Soviet Union, so audience members could ask each other questions. My name is Richard Phillips, and I'd like to ask about the music scene. Is there a lot of uh, rock and roll in the Soviet Union? We uh, dance uh, some of the modern dances, and all love them very much. And Americans could watch a far-out performance from Arsenal, one of Russia's premier jazz bands. For Waz, the festival was also a way to espouse his vision. Originally, the idea was just do a major rock country-oriented concert somewhere in the western states. From that, the idea of, hey, we can show people how computers and technology are bringing people closer together. And it all came to a head right before the first night headliners. Waz had a flying saucer appear over the crowd, towed by helicopters. The alien pilot then hijacked the Jumbotron. Who the hell are you? Delivering a 30-minute speech about peace and unity. What do you dream? I am the yearning for peace. I am the dream of a world without limits, a world of ideas that haven't been tried. Obviously what this crowd was itching to hear. But if Waz was hoping the audience would leave inspired, he probably shouldn't have had the Clash play right afterwards. I know the human race is supposed to get down on its knees in front of all this new technology and kiss the microchip circuits. It doesn't impress me over much. But there ain't nothing but a, you buy, you make, you buy, you die. That's the motto of America. Over the next hour, Joe Strummer delivered a series of bitter monologues, broken up only when his band members insisted they play some songs. Yeah, anybody up? On the surface, it looked like The Clash were delivering a counterpoint to Waz's tech bro optimism pointing out the hypocrisies and elitism of the festival. And I tell you, those people out in East LA, they ain't gonna stay there forever. And if there's anything gonna be in the future, it's gotta be from all parts of everything, not just one white way down the middle of the road. But behind the scenes, the clash were feuding with Wozniak and festival organizers all day. For one, they were furious to have discovered that Van Halen were getting paid one million compared to their own 500,000. In a press conference, they demanded Waz donate an additional 100,000 to charity, a request that was partially fulfilled. But later on, when hanging out backstage, Waz made matters worse by handing their manager a prank slot machine that squirted him with water. The band was agitated, to say the least. Festival crew members got so fed up with the band during their set they projected an image of their paycheck on the screen, which would have looked quite funny next to the Clash Not For Sale banner that hung behind the stage. The Clash left without playing an encore. The Clash have left the building. And exchanged some punches with crew members on the way out. Unfortunately for them, it would be Van Halen who got the last word when they took the stage the following night. I want to take this time to say, that this is real whiskey here. The only people who put iced tea in Jack Daniels bottles is the Clash, baby! The 
Us Festival marked a turning point for The Clash, who would fire co-lead singer Mick Jones that fall and never quite rebound. While the Us Festival was not cited as a reason for his firing, it was the last show they all played together, and one that garnered them heaps of bad press. So, did Steve Wozniak play a role in their breakup? Well, the prank slot machine certainly didn't help. Okay guys, that is going to conclude this first volume of Musical Facts. Like, subscribe, and click on this channel for more stories like this. And stay tuned for another volume in the future.